Good evening and welcome to our program. This series is focusing on This Is Your FBI. This Is Your FBI was a radio crime drama which aired in the United States on ABC from April 6, 1945 to January 30th, 1953 for a total of 409 shows. The show featured true cases from the FBI and was told from an FBI agent's viewpoint. FBI Chief J. Edgar Hoover gave it his endorsement, calling it our show and calling it the finest dramatic program on the air. Generally, I do not include advisories. Given Hoover's polarizing nature, I will share this. Dramatized stories created for propaganda purposes are not history. They tell one biased side of the story, and in no way am I saying that these are reliable stories. I just believe them to be interesting when viewed through the scope of entertainment and weird history. Finally, I'd like to send a specific thank you to publicdomainreview.org and archive.org for organizing and compiling all of this media. If you would like to listen to standalone media, we have included a link in the description. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This Is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. This afternoon and this evening, all over the country, Equitable Society representatives have been calling their friends on the telephone. Hello? Good evening, Mr. Long. This is Frank Morris, representing the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Mr. Long, I just wanted to remind you to listen to the Equitable Society's program tonight. It's This Is Your FBI. Yeah, I know. I listen every Friday. Well... Tonight, the Equitable Society has an announcement that is going to interest you personally. The Equitable Society has just issued a new and enlarged edition of its famous fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Don't miss the middle commercial. Find out how to get your copy of the Equitable Society's fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Tonight's FBI file... The Happy Honeymooners. Crime in the United States today is at an all-time high. And the figures gathered by your FBI and by other law enforcement agencies are enough to shock even the most complacent into a realization that the time to fight the crime wave is now. There is an average of more than 2,000 thefts committed in this country every day, or more than one every minute around the clock. That fact is serious enough. But even more serious is the companion truth that crime, like any disease, spreads quickly when it remains unchecked. We are all about to enter a new year. If we all do our part to help fight that crime wave, it can be a year to be remembered with pride. If we fail to do our part, then the same crimes we suffered this year will be repeated. With one difference, there will be more of them. Tonight's file opens on a remote country lane in one of our Midwestern states. It is early afternoon, and a young boy and girl are riding along the river road in a brand-new convertible. Isn't this nice, honey? Oh, it's lovely, Eddie. Just lovely. <laughs> Happy? Very. Oh, look at that view. You can see ten miles up the river. Uh-huh. Oh, gee, I wish we could sometimes settle down in a place like this. I hate to keep traveling all the time. Well, I don't like it too much myself, dear, but I you I know. Gotta... Business comes first. That's right. Well, this is where we get out. What do you mean? Look through those trees. You see that cabin? Uh-huh. It's ours. What? I rented it this morning. Oh, Eddie, you didn't. I've got the keys right here. Come on. Oh, Eddie, this is such a wonderful surprise. I hoped you'd think so. Gee... 
just what I've always dreamed about. Honest? Honest. It's perfect. I just wish now that... You wish what, honey? Well, I don't want to have to leave this. So you don't. You mean we're going to settle down? Be in one place? Yeah. But what about work? Oh, well, we'll keep working. In fact, we got a job tonight. We're sticking up a jewelry store. <laughs> Go ahead, honey. Ring the bell. Okay. Gee, what a ring. Yeah. You think anybody's home? Oh, oh yeah, I checked. Yes? Uh, good evening, Mr. Mitchell. Good evening. I'm sorry to trouble you, but my car broke down outside your door. I was wondering whether I might use your phone to call a garage. Certainly. Right in. Oh, thanks. Go ahead. Okay. A young couple. Their car broke down and they want to use the phone. Oh. Well, Howard asked them to take off their coats. They must be drenched. I'll uh, keep mine on, Mrs. Mitchell. I'm going right out again. In fact, your husband's coming with me. Oh. What? Howard, he's got a gun. What is this? Now, don't get excited, folks. Howard, please. this is a holdup. If it is, he's wasting his time. We have nothing of value here. We know that, Mr. Mitchell. Then My what? My husband wants you to take him down to your jewelry store. Then, if you don't mind, he'd like to have you open your safe. I won't do it. Mr. Mitchell, this gun here says you got him. How would you better do as he says? He's right, Mr. Mitchell. All right, Mary. I'll go with him. Oh, swell. What happens to my wife? Oh, my bride won't mind staying here with her, will you, Lucy? Of course not. I just love to visit. She'll stay here till I get the jewelry. Oh, by the way, Mrs. Mitchell. Yes? She has a gun, too. Well, come on, sir. We better get going. Very well. Wait, Eddie. Huh? It's such a nasty night out, honey. Ask Mr. Mitchell if he'd mind bringing an umbrella. That same evening in the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is seated at his desk just finishing a report on his last case. Busy, Jim? Hmm? Oh, hello, Doug. What are you doing around the office this late? Oh, uh, the boss called me at home and asked me to come in. Huh? Something special come up? Maybe yes, maybe no. Will you wait one second while I sign this report in the Fulton case, and I'll be all finished here. Yeah, I'm certainly glad that file is closed. Oh, my. I don't want any more of those tough cases. I'd like to work on a simple one for a change. We don't get any simple ones. <laughs> I guess not. Well, what have you got, Doug? Well, about two weeks ago, two youngsters stuck up a jeweler in Memphis, and we just got word from the Memphis office about it. Memphis thinks they're headed this way? That's it. The switchboard is working now, covering every hotel in town. But I doubt that it'll do any good. Oh, why not? Well, the descriptions aren't good enough. Too general. Hmm. But all we know is that one is a girl, and that both the girl and boy are blonde. Mm -hmm. Anything unusual about the robbery? Yes. They went to the home of the jeweler at night, forced him to ride back to the store and open the safe. Well, that's a no wrinkle. You know, I wish people would pay more attention to robbers when they're held up. Not one in 20 can give you any kind of a description at all. Well, this jeweler in Memphis claims he was so scared he forgot everything. Hey, how'd they get into the jeweler's house? Oh, phony story about the car breaking down outside the door. I see. What do you think we ought to do first, Jim? Well, let's see. It's, uh, 7 o'clock now. I guess all the jewelry stores are closed by now, aren't they? Well, I imagine so. Well, we'd better get a list of the home phone numbers of every jeweler in town. You know, I think I know where I can lay my hands on that kind of a list, Jim. Fine. Get the list and we'll split it up and make the calls ourselves. Uh, Doug, how long will it take you to get the numbers? Oh, about 15 minutes at most. Good. I'll wait right here for you. When you get back, we'll go to work. <laughs> oh, gee, Mrs. Mitchell, I wish you'd stop that crying. Everything's going to be all right. I know it is. Look... Worrying isn't going to do you a bit of good. I know from experience. When I first started dating, Eddie used to do jobs all by himself, and I used to just worry myself sick about him. But he always came home safe and sound. Oh, please leave me alone. Well, I'm only trying to be sociable. I'm only trying to point out that you shouldn't be so unhappy. In fact, if I was you, I'd be glad. My gosh, you've got a beautiful home here. You don't have to travel. You've got lots to be thankful for, Mrs. Mitchell. Why did you have to pick on us? Huh? 
There are other jewelers in this city. Why did you pick on my husband? Well, you know, that's a funny thing. We went window shopping one day, and we passed your husband's store, and I saw a ring in the window that I was just nuts about. So right then and there, I said, it... Wait, Mrs. Mitchell, before you answer it, I'll have to ask that you don't let on that anything's wrong. And make the conversation very short. Very well. Hello? Uh, hello, Mrs. Mitchell? May I speak to my wife, please? It's for you. Thank you. Hello? Hello, honey. Everything's fine down here. Mr. Mitchell was very cooperative. Oh, good. Yeah, I'll be leaving here in a few minutes. I'll see you back at the cabin. Well, how are you going to get there? Oh, in Mr. Mitchell's car. Well, that's nice of him. All right, dear, I'll meet you in about half an hour. Oh, fine. I love you, honey. I love you, baby. Bye-bye. Goodbye. I'm sorry, Mrs. Mitchell, but I've got to go now. Oh, thank you. Before I leave, though, please be a lamb and let me tie you up. Hi, Jim. How you coming? Made my last call a minute ago. How about you? I just finished. Well, it ought to be tougher than to pull that same stunt on any jeweler around here. Yeah, I think so. Hey, uh, any numbers on your list that didn't answer? Yes, two. Mm -hmm. Say, um, how about the newspaper? I've already called them, Doug. They'll use the story tomorrow. Oh, excuse me. Special Agent Taylor speaking. Mr. Taylor, this is Sergeant Drew down at headquarters. Yes, Sergeant. We just got a call from a Mrs. Howard Mitchell in Springtown. Mm -hmm. She says a young couple came into her house tonight and made her husband go down to his store and open the safe. Uh, Sergeant, is Mr. Mitchell a jeweler by any chance? That's right. How'd you know? We've been looking for that couple, Sergeant. Have you got any descriptions on them? <laughs> Not very much. Mrs. Mitchell was too excited to tell me more than just the bare facts. Mm -hmm. You say this Mr. Mitchell was brought into the city from Springtown. That's right. That's across the state line, Mr. Taylor. That's why I called you. That makes it a kidnapping case. Uh, Sergeant, what's Mrs. Mitchell's address? 169 Bedford Street, Springtown. 169 Bedford. And the address of her husband's store? 1218 Fifth Avenue. 1218 Fifth. Thanks very much, Sergeant. We'll get on it right away. Doug, we've got some work to do. What's that, Jim? A young couple has already pulled a job. Well, that's what I gather. A local jeweler was taken from his home to his store. Here's the address of the store, Doug. You check there. I'm going out to the man's home. <laughs> Who's there? Oh, oh, just a second. Oh, baby, you're soaked. I know. Oh, gee, why oh, didn't you blow the yeah. horn or something? I, I would have come out with Mr. Mitchell's umbrella. Oh, that's okay. Oh. Let me get this coat off. Sure, let me help you. Oh. My gosh, I never saw such rain. Yeah, I know. Eddie, huh. where's the jewelry? Oh, right over there in that bag. Oh, I can't wait to see it. Okay, I'll get it for you. Okay. Eddie? Yeah. Isn't that Mr. Mitchell there in the corner? Mm-hmm. Well, what's he doing here? Oh, I brought him back with me. Looks like he's tied up. He is. Here. Take a look at this stuff. Oh, Eddie. Real nice, huh? Oh, it's beautiful. And look here, honey. Remember this? It's a ring I like so much. Uh-huh. I had Mr. Mitchell make a special effort to put that in. Oh, honey, you're so thoughtful. Boy, that's okay. Eddie? Yeah, dear? What made you bring Mr. Mitchell home with you? Oh, we had a reason. We only have one bedroom. Well, he can sleep where he is tonight. What was your reason? Well, I figured he could afford to give us a little more money. How? Oh. Well, I called his wife and told her we were going to keep Mr. Mitchell until she gave us $20,000. <laughs> Return in just a moment to tonight's file, which shows how your FBI promotes security for the nation. Now let's bring this question of security closer to home. Mac, you're a father. Did you ever see a chart like this before? Hmm. A fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. What's it all about, anyway? This fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers has just been published by the Equitable Society to perform a very useful service for a man like you. Go on, I'm listening, Mr. Keating. It was designed to show you how much money your family would really need to keep going if you should die. 
Fill in this fact-finding chart, and you'll know exactly what income will be required to keep your wife and children well-fed, well-housed, and well-clothed. Hey, that's something every man with a family ought to figure out. Well, with this Equitable Society chart, you'll have the answer in five minutes flat. Look, you're guided every step of the way by easy-to-understand pictures, which illustrate the rock-bottom expenses your family will have to meet. And when you finish, you'll have a clear, accurate, and complete picture of just what income your family would need during the critical years. Critical years? What's that mean? The years before your youngest child finishes high school. Years during which the home must have a minimum income to keep it together. Okay. I'm going to buy one of these fact-finding charts tomorrow. Now, they're not for sale, Mac. They're free. The Equitable Society representative in your community will be glad to bring you a copy. Sit down with him, you and your wife together. There's no obligation, and get a true picture of where you stand. Phone him tomorrow to bring you an equitable fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Or send a postcard, care of this ABC station, to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Happy Honeymooners. According to the most recent figures available, there are approximately seven and one-half million persons with arrest records in the United States today. And like any other group of people, they have certain things in common. But there is one thing which each criminal has that is his and his alone, his appearance. No two criminals look alike any more than any two decent citizens look exactly alike. It has been a popular misapprehension that you can spot a criminal by watching him. Experts in the living habits and movements of criminals like the special agents of your FBI will be the first to tell you that nothing could be further from the truth. There is absolutely no way to tell a criminal from a law-abiding person until one of them commits a crime. For that reason, your FBI advises extreme caution in dealing with any strangers. Do not assume that every stranger is a thief. But by the same token, being careful may save you from becoming another victim of America's current crime wave. Tonight's file continues in the FBI field office. Special Agent Taylor has just returned to the office from his interview with Mrs. Mitchell. Well, Jim, I see you got soaked too. Yeah, out of the skin. I don't think I ever saw it rain this way. I certainly hope your trip was more productive than mine. Nothing at the store at all, huh? Not a thing. The police had already arrived when I got there, and they went over everything. How about the safe? Oh, it was wide open and empty. No fingerprints? None at all. Hmm. I imagine that Mitchell must have opened the safe himself, but if he did, he was wearing gloves. How about Mrs. Mitchell? Well, she was all right until she got a phone call from the man the girl called Eddie. Eddie said he was holding Mr. Mitchell for $20,000 ransom. Mm-hmm. They didn't kidnap the jeweler in Memphis. No, no, they just robbed him. This is something new. How is uh, Mrs. Mitchell going to contact them? Oh, she's not. When Eddie called, she said that she didn't have $20,000, so he said he'd give her a little while to dig it up, that he'd uh, call her back. Well, any call out to Springtown is a long-distance call, Jim. Uh, I know. The phone company is going to trace any call made to the Mitchell's number. Mm-hmm. We'd better sit right here until they call. Yeah, that's about all we can do. Could Mrs. Mitchell uh, describe the couple? Only very poorly. She was... Practically in hysterics, my doctor. She couldn't... Oh, pardon me. Special Agent Taylor. This is Sergeant Drew again. Yes, Sergeant. Mrs. Mitchell got another call from the kidnapper. How long ago? About five minutes ago. Operator Trace it? Yes, she said the call came from Centerville. Centerville 842. Centerville 842. Thanks, Sergeant. We'll get on it right away. That was our call, Doug. Mitchell is being held at the house with the phone number Centerville 842. Let's check that number and get out there as fast as we can. Yes, honey. I was just listening to the most wonderful program on the radio. All about a woman who forgets her name and she can't remember where she uh, lives. Uh, and... Look, look, dear. I'm trying to make a rough estimate on these jewels. Tell me later, huh? But, Eddie, the announcer broke into the middle of it. Oh? What did he say? He said that the river was rising. Mm-hmm. He said it'll flood the whole valley, that everyone will be marooned here after the night. Hey, that's not so good. What do we do, honey? We're practically next to the river. Yeah. 
I think maybe we'd better get out of here. Oh. Look, if we're marooned here, we'll get picked up for everything. Well, what do we do with Mr. Mitchell? We'll just have to leave him here. How about the $20,000 from Mrs. Mitchell? I think we better settle for the jewels. Are your bags still packed? Yes. Well, you better get them, and we better get going. Well, can't we wait about ten more minutes? What for? I want to hear how that program comes out. Take a look at that river, Jim. Yeah, it's really roaring. I don't think I've ever seen it that high. It's flood stage, all right. Think the bridge will still be open? All we can do is hope. Closed, we don't get across. Mm, I know. Look, Jim. Huh? There's a man with a lantern in the road. Yeah, yeah, I see him. Coming around on my side. I'll roll my window down, Doug. Sorry, sir. The bridge is closed. We're both special agents of the FBI. You're my credentials. Is there any chance of us getting across? Oh, I wouldn't suggest it. Huh? How bad is it? There's no telling. But you can gamble if you want to. Doug? Any way you want it, Jim. Well, let's take a chance. Okay with me? We're going to try it. Well, good luck. I sure hope you make it. Thanks. The left a little, Jim. Okay. Hold it. Huh? What is it? That railing is down. Suppose that means anything? Well, let's find out. The water looks pretty deep up ahead. Keep the wires dry. Go for it slow. Okay, now, this is the end of the bridge. Yeah. Now, let's go find our couple. They're going all right. Look, there's Mitchell tied up over there in the corner. Yeah. How is he, Jim? Mm. He's breathing, but he's unconscious. Come on. Come on, it's in time. Get him to a doctor and then come back here. Daddy. Hmm? You know, how are you thinking? About what, honey? About how nice it must be to live like Mr. and Mrs. Mitchell. What do you mean? You know, with a nice home and pictures on the wall. And a place where you can have your friends over for dinner. Hey, I'm not sorry you married me, are you, honey? No, oh, Eddie, you know I'm not. Oh, it's just that I wish you weren't a traveling man. Oh, but you knew what business I was in when we got married. I know, dear. I'm not complaining, honey. What are you stopping for, honey? Well, there's a fork in the road, a... Uh, take a look at the map and see which way we go, huh? Oh, Eddie, I forgot it. I left it in the cabin. Oh. Well, I'll take a chance on this right turn. Where are we going, honey? To Chicago and sell the jewelry. And then on to New York. Come on, Doug. I want to see where this door leads to. All right. What's there, Jim? It's a shed attached to the cabin. It's been used as a garage. Mitchell's car is here. They must have used their own car for a getaway. Mm-hmm. What do you got there? A map. I wonder if it was theirs. Is that a route marked on it? Yeah. Yeah, it's the road between here and Chicago. Mm, it still doesn't help much. We don't know what kind of a car they were driving. We don't know what they looked like. Mm-hmm. Aside from that, everything's under control. Mm-hmm. Not much point in setting up a roadblock if we haven't got a description. Wait a minute, Doug. Well, look here. Hmm. Look, this can give us one lead on that young couple. Come on, let's get to the phone. Take a right.
right turn here, Jim. I know. Got about five more miles to go. Uh-huh. You spoke to Mitchell's wife. Yes, I called her from the doctor's home. I told her he'd be okay. I hope that roadblock has been set up. I just hope it was set up in time. There's a line of cars up ahead, Jim. That's the beginning of the roadblock. It's like a hundred cars or more. I was hoping there wouldn't be that many. What are they all doing out in weather like this? They're probably trying to get into the city before both bridges go out. Do we start at the head of the line? No, Doug. We'll park it here and walk up. Only about 20 more cars, Jim. Well, we can't get any wetter. That's one consolation. <laughs> That's true. Now, well, let's take a look at this convertible. Okay. Doug? Yeah. Shine your flashlight closer, will you? How's that? Yeah, that's fine. I think we may have something here. I wonder how long they're going to keep us waiting here. Oh, a man said it'd be only a couple of minutes. He said they were fixing the road. Well, this is certainly a silly time to be fixing a road. That's all I can say. Well, maybe the storm washed some of the gravel away. Betty. Huh? Look, here on my side. Well, what is it? Two men standing there. Oh, maybe their car got stuck. They're looking in, Eddie. Maybe they're cops. We better get out of here. Hey, that's what we're going to do. Look out, Eddie. They both got guns. There you are. Oh, oh, no. Special agents, the FBI. What do you want? We want you for armed robbery and kidnapping. Well, you must be mistaken. No, no. no your car left its signature in the dirt floor of the garage by your cabin. Huh? Your left rear tire had a deep gash in its diamond-shaped thread. That's all we had to look for, but it was enough. Mister, can you close the door? I'm getting soaked. Oh, don't worry about that, lady. Both of you are going to a place where you'll be dry for a long, long time. The wanton young couple was sentenced to 25 years and 15 years, respectively, for kidnapping and violation of the National Stolen Property Act. And thus, by careful investigation and hard work, your FBI thwarted the get-rich-quick scheme of another pair of criminals. A pair who proved they would stop at nothing. A pair who, though young and innocent in appearance, were as completely criminal as any murderers on record. That their well-laid plans came to nothing is a tribute to the thoroughness with which two special agents followed every clue and kept following them until they achieved the two goals of your FBI in every kidnapping case the safe return of the victim, and the capture of the criminals. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the official files of your FBI. Now back to the news we announced in our middle commercial. The new and enlarged fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers just issued by the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Uh, Mr. Keating, let's see if I've got this straight. The purpose of this chart is to give me a true picture of the minimum income required to give my family a decent standard of living if I should die. That's right, Mac. And the man who'll see that you get one of these fact-finding charts is your Equitable Society representative. No charge or obligation, of course. Phone your Equitable Society representative soon. Or send a postcard, care of this ABC station, to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Meanwhile, your Equitable representative wishes you a very happy new year. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A case involving the operations of a gang of professional thieves. Its subject, bank robbery. Its title... The Sorrowful Safe Cracker. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis, your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community, 
and inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Sorrowful Safe Cracker on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This Is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Tonight, would you know what to say if your telephone should ring like this? Yes? This is the Radio Checking Bureau. Is your radio turned on? Why, yes, it is. What program are you listening to, please? It's, uh, this is your FBI, just starting. Do you know who sponsors that program? Sure I do. It's the Equitable Life Assurance Society. I listened to this equitable program last week. Heard about the Equitable Society's fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. My Equitable Society representative bought me a copy. Oh, naturally, I know that This Is Your FBI is sponsored by the Equitable Society. In about 15 minutes, I'll be back with full information about the Equitable Society's fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Tonight's FBI file, The Sorrowful Safe Crackers. Passions in crime, just as there are in any other field. And while there are some who go against the trend, most criminals, like most legitimate citizens, follow the current fashion religiously. Some years ago, for instance, if a criminal wanted a quick reputation among his fellows, or if he wanted the biggest possible loot, he planned to rob a bank. In those days, bank robbery was almost a common crime. Or banks were poorly protected. But today, all that has changed. Few criminals will undertake the tremendous risk involved in robbing a bank. In one six-month period last year, for instance, there were only 21 bank robberies attempted. Thieves have turned to attacking easier targets. That is, most of them have. But despite the overwhelming odds against them, there are still some criminals who believe that they can succeed where so many others have failed, who believe that they are smarter than the law. Tonight's file opens in a small furnished room located in the downtown district of a large western city. Harry Wheeler, a lean, hungry-looking young man, is reading a book when there is a knock at the door. It's open. Hi, Harry. Oh, Frankie. Hey, it's getting cold out. You got a drink, Andy? Yeah. Here's a bottle. Help me some. Thanks. Yeah, what are you doing, Reedy? Yeah. What are you wasting your time with that for? I ain't wasting my time. This is very special reading. Uh, nice. Hit me with it. Well, I, I don't know... Quite now, how to tell you this, Frankie, but uh, well, for the last couple of months, I, I ain't been getting no fun out of my job. Hey, what do you want with fun? You get money, don't you? Oh, sure. But in the beginning, every time I cracked the safe, I, I got a big jolt. Now it's nothing. Hey, that don't make sense. Well, maybe it don't to you, Frankie, but it does to me. That's what made me go to a psychiatrist. A what? Well, them doctors that make you talk. You mean... Like that guy in the picture with Ingrid Bergman? Yeah, yeah, that's right. What do you need with, uh, with one of those guys? You going crazy? Oh, of course not. I went to him because I needed to get straightened out. I did. That 
That's why I'm not doing any more jobs. <laughs> what about tomorrow? You and Rip have to get another guy. Now, look, Harry, we got My mind's made up. But what about tomorrow? The doc says I should never been a thief in the first place. What does he want you to do, get a job in a grocery store? No, he, he thinks I ought to get away from the city. So I'm going to. You're going to what? I'm going to take his advice and get me chicken farm. Now, look, Harry, the job is all set for tomorrow. Where is Rip going to get another guy that quick? The job has got to be done on a holiday when the bank is closed. You know that? Frankie, I made up my mind. No more jobs. Fix me another drink, will you? Here's my glass. Yes. What is it? You know what I saw downtown today? What? The most beautiful gabardine suit with a long skirt and those narrow shoulders. You'd love it on me. All right. You just got a new dress and two new hats. Yeah, but this suit's a bargain. How much? Three hundred. Wait till after the job tomorrow. Then will you get it for me? I don't know yet. Answer that, will you? Sure. Just a minute. Hiya, Nora. Hello, Frank. Come on in. Rip, we got trouble. What kind of trouble? Harry is pulling out of the job. What? When did that happen? Just now. I just left him. What's the matter with him? He want a bigger cut? Nah, he went to some doctor and the guy told him he shouldn't do no more jobs. What kind of a doctor is that? I don't know. He told me, but I don't remember. I better go talk to him. Uh, talk and do no good, Rip. He says he's finished. All right, don't get excited. Don't we have to do the job tomorrow? We'll do it tomorrow. And we'll do it with Harry. Telling you, Rip, talk will do no good with him. His mind is wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Honora. Yes? You want to get that gabardine suit? Oh, honey. Not so fast. First, you got a job to do. What kind of a job? Harry Wheeler's always been a little strong for you, hasn't he? I think Harry likes me. Don't con me, honey. This is important. So he has a yen for me. It's not my fault. I'm not blaming you. I just want you to throw some charm at him. I know she said. Well, what? What are you two talking about? Nora, Harry wants to pull out of the job tomorrow. Huh? You get him to go along with us, and you got your suit. Honey, you just made a deal. <laughs> Two days later, in the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is seated at his desk when Agent Don Brooks approaches. Hello, Don. Hello, Jim. Well, when did you come back to work? I checked in this morning. Uh-huh. How do you feel? Well, I'll be all right. I was three weeks in the hospital. Straighten me out fine. Hey, you look great. What are you working on? Well, the boss asked me to work with you on that bank job that was pulled yesterday. <laughs> I'm glad he did. It's a tough one. Oh, what's the story? Well, the robbers, whoever they were, rented the store next to the bank a month ago. And they dug a tunnel from the store onto the bank and into the bank's basement. Well, how come they didn't set off the alarm? The trap wires don't run underneath the vault, and I guess they knew it. You think they might have had some inside help? No, I kind of doubt that, Don. After all, if they'd had inside help, they probably wouldn't have had to rent the store and dig the tunnel. Yeah, that's true. How much did they get? About $55,000. All of it in cash? Yes, they didn't touch any of the bonds that were in the vault. Once they got inside, of course, they turned off the alarm. That's right. Then they had an expert who blew that safe. I was down there this morning, and whoever did that job really knew what he was doing. Mm. Now, what time was the job done? During the day, according to the clock on the vault, it was blown at 11.14. How come there wasn't anybody in the bank at that time in the morning? That's closed, remember? The mayor declared a holiday yesterday because it was the city's 100th birthday. Oh, yeah, I remember. Whoever planned this job planned it to happen just as the parade was passing the bank. I spoke to some people who were standing in front of the bank. They didn't hear a thing. Well, how did they get away? Well, imagine they came back through the tunnel and out of the store. After that, they could melt into the crowd, isn't it? Mm. Any fingerprints on the vault? Not only no fingerprints, but not a single clue anyway. Who rented the store? The man who gave his name is William Adams. He paid cash for the first two months rent. I guess William Adams is not available. Huh? Correct. He gave the landlord a fake address, so it probably isn't his right name either. Any description on it? No, no. The renting agent couldn't remember much about him. You were right when you said this was a tough one, Jim. What do you think we ought to do for a start? Well, Don, I think the best thing to do is get out the file of known bank robbers and take their pictures out of that running agent. If he recognizes any of them as Adams, we start to look for him. And if he doesn't? Well, if he doesn't, we'll try somewhere else. But for now, let's get those pictures and go to work. (laughs) 
Okay, okay. Hold it a minute. Hello, Rip. Hello, Frankie. Come on in. Hey, the, uh, the job went okay, huh? Yeah, of course. I told you there wouldn't be trouble. Where's the dough? I rented a safe deposit box. Put it in there this morning. At the bank? Sure, it's safe in there. When we get ready to blow, we take it out. Hmm? When do you think you want to be moving? Oh, I don't know. A week, ten days, then we go back east, do another job. It's all cased out. Yeah? What kind of a job? Same thing. A job. Oh. Hey, who do we get to fill in for Harry? We don't need anybody. He'll be there. But he told me he was going to take the move from this job and pay for that chicken farm. How can he pay for the farm if he ain't got the dough? Well, his hand will be more than the farm, of course. I'm not giving him a dime. Oh, now, Rip, what'll that prove? Then he'll only get sore and never do another job. Yes, he will. He'll be back. What's going to make him? Nora. Oh. After we went to the bank this morning, I sent her down to see Harry. He's going to throw some uh, charm at him. And make him stay with us? That's the idea. Then with Harry, all we got to do is four or five more jobs like this. We can all quit with plenty of money in the bank. Yes, Jim. While you were out, we got a break. Here, take a look at this picture. Well? The blow-up of a section of yesterday's parade. The newspaper photographer who took it just brought it in. Take a look at that background. See the bank? Mm-hmm. And the store next to the bank? Hey, that's three men coming out of that store. That's right. Here, take a look at this through this glass here. There's a funnel take there. Yeah, it must be the money. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, only one face shows up in that picture. He's been identified, though, as a thief named Joe Stewart. Well, what are these other pictures? Oh, well, those are a gallery of everyone who was ever arrested with Stuart. Mm, they ought to come in handy. Mm-hmm. Say, uh, did you notice the suit on the one who's holding the door open for the other two? Well, the one whose back is turned to the camera? Yeah. That's a pretty loud stripe to show up so clearly in a picture taken at that distance. Yeah. Who took the picture, Jim? One of the regular photographers in the morning dispatch. He just went up to the second floor of a building to get a better angle on the parade. Has it appeared in the paper? Mm-hmm. Oh, too bad. Oh, you mean because it'll warn the bandits that we know who they are? Uh-huh. They'll really go under. Yes, but by the same token, we also have a whole city full of helpers now. If anybody sees this man any place, they'll call the police. Uh-huh, that's true. And if they stayed in town thinking they had done a perfect job, they'll have a tough time getting transportation out. Mm-hmm. Every bus line, railroad station, and airline ticket counter has been alerted. Good. Well, what do you think we ought to do now, Jim? First thing to do is find Joe Stewart. Let's take another look for his record and see if we can get a lead. <laughs> Take it easy. Take it easy! Oh, Rip. What's the matter with you? I'm glad you're still here. Why? Don't you know what happened? What are you talking about? You ain't seen the paper yet. No, they got a story about the job? A story, nothing. They got your picture. What? Yeah. Let me see that paper. Yeah. That's the three of them. Yeah. But your face is the only one that shows. You're the one who takes the rap. How do you like that? Yeah. What do we do now? We can't blow town. They'll be looking for me on the rocks. But well, we can't stay here, Rip. One of these bellboys or somebody will turn you in for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's true. You take it, Frankie. Okay. Hello? Hello, Frankie. This is Nora. Oh. It's Nora, Joe. Let me talk to her. Yeah. Nora? Yeah? You still with Harry? Uh-huh. You better get back here right away. Why not? Harry, don't want me to. That's all off now. But you asked me to talk him out of buying that chicken farm. I know I did. Well, I did what you asked me to do. He's not going to buy the farm. I don't care about the farm now. Get up here as fast as you can. We've got to make a quick move. You mean because your picture was in the paper? Well, you've seen it, huh? Yeah. Well, then get back here. we got to go under. Joe. What? You'll have to go by yourself. What do you mean? Well, instead of buying the chicken farm, Harry's going to Florida... And I just promised him that I'm going with him. Goodbye. Hello? 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 What's the matter, Rip? Nora and Harry. They're double-crossing us, Frankie. They're going to go to Florida together. Uh, what do you lose? Just another stupid dame. Just another stupid dame, huh? That stupid dame happens to have the other key to my safe deposit box. What? And all our dough is in that box. <laughs> We 
will return in just a moment to tonight's file which shows how your FBI promotes security for the nation. Now let's bring this question of security closer to home. A year ago on this program, the Equitable Life Assurance Society offered a special fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. The response was overwhelming. Thousands of charts were distributed by equitable representatives, and the supply was quickly exhausted. So this year, the Equitable Society has prepared a new and enlarged edition of the fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. It's ready now. Just what does this chart do that makes it so popular, Mr. Keating? Well, Tom, it was designed to open your eyes to what your family's financial needs would be if you should die. Fill in this fact-finding chart, and you'll know within a dollar or two how much money would be required to keep your wife and children well-fed, well-housed, and well-clothed. Come to think of it, that is something I ought to know. Tom, with this Equitable Society chart, you'll have the answer in five minutes flat. Look, you're guided every step of the way by easy-to-understand pictures, which illustrate the rock-bottom expenses your family will have to meet. And when you've finished... You'll have a clear, accurate, and complete picture of just what income your family would need during the critical years. Hold on a bit, Mr. Keating. Just what are these critical years? The years before your youngest child finishes high school. Years during which the home must have a minimum income to keep it together. You saw me, Mr. Keating. Where do I buy one of these fact-finding charts? You can't buy them, Tom. They're free. The Equitable Society representative in your community will be glad to bring you a copy. Sit down with him, you and your wife together. There's no obligation, and get a true picture of where you stand. Phone him tomorrow to bring you an equitable fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Or send a postcard care of this ABC station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Sorrowful Safe Cracker. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI graphically proves one important point about the alleged loyalties of one criminal for another. It proves that these loyalties are entirely legendary. The criminal who pursues his livelihood outside the common decencies does not have any loyalty nor anything else that is not for sale. He may hire his talent, his mind, or his muscles, but only for the money, never for anything else. By the very nature of his chosen career, sentimentality to the point of loyalty would be a liability. Because while it is true that a criminal may plan his every action, there is no way of his foretelling one important thing, and that is, who is going to double-cross him next? The only more important element in his plans is, who can I double-cross next myself? Tonight's file continues in the hotel apartment of Joe Stewart. He's seated in an upholstered easy chair, running his fingers nervously through his hair. How could she do this? I spent every dime I had on her. I know. Why would she want to leave a guy like me for a moax like Harry? Yeah, the dirty crooks have probably emptied that safety deposit box by now. Well, even if they have, they're not going to swing with my dough. They, uh, they ripped one. How come you, uh... He gives Nora one of the keys to the box. In case I get into a jam and I couldn't go get the dough myself. I never figured she'd double-cross me. Well, we still got to get out of here. How can we move without dough? You carrying anything? Yeah, about a yard. I got 200. Uh, hey, Rip, I know where we can go. Where? Out to Harry's chicken farm. You know where it is? Yeah. Okay, let's pack and blow out the back way. Don, here I am. Oh, well, fine, Jim. Clerk at this hotel recognized Stewart's picture and called the office. That's why I left that note for you. Uh-huh. Is Stewart living here? He was, but by the time the clerk called, Stewart had already sneaked out of his room. We didn't miss him by much, though. I found a cigar butt in one of the ashtrays. It was still warm. And he leaves it all on where he might have gone? The manager gave me this list. Oh, what is it? The list of the phone calls Stewart made for the past two weeks. Well, that might give us a lead. Mm-hmm. Uh, was there anything at all left in Stewart's apartment? No, he cleaned it out pretty well. The only thing in the place were these two library books. Oh, what are they? How to raise chickens, and this other one is those golden eggs. 
What was Stewart doing with books like that? I don't know, but it kind of ties into something I picked up at the switchboard. Oh, what was that? Operator told me she cut into Stewart's last phone call by mistake and heard some woman mention a chicken farm. Was that all she heard? No. You know, maybe Stewart is using that farm as a hideout. Mm, Could be. Were the library books taken out in his name? I don't know. There's no card in either one of them. Hmm. I don't suppose we can check with anyone from the library at this hour. No, I tried from the phone up in Stewart's room. There won't be anyone there until 9 in the morning. And by that time, Stewart can be wherever he's headed for. Well, John, the only thing we can do now is go back to the office and start checking these phone numbers. Yeah. If they don't give us anything, we'll check with the library first thing in the morning. Frankie. Frankie, get up! Oh. Come on, get up. Okay. You're all dressed, huh? I haven't been to bed yet. Why not? Those chickens, they drive you daffy. I kind of like them. Are you kidding? Look, I've been thinking how we can get our dough. In the safe deposit box? Yeah. yeah. I remember that when Nora called me yesterday afternoon, I looked at my watch. It was exactly 4.50. Well? Banks close at 3 o'clock. That means they couldn't have gotten the dough yesterday. Hey, that's right. Nora will go to the bank as soon as it opens this morning. What did you say? I said Nora will go to the bank as soon as it opens this morning. Oh. Now I want you to get dressed and meet her. Huh? Will you get dressed and get out of here? Plenty of time, yes. Oh, sure. It won't take us well, ten minutes to get the money once we get to the bank. We'll have this cab wait for it. Happy? Gosh, yes. Will you... Will you miss that doctor? I should say not. <laughs> You're just what the doctor ordered. <laughs> oh, Harry, that's sweet. Oh. <laughs> uh, do we go much farther? No, the bank's right ahead. Well, it ought to be open by this time. Sure, that's the building driver on the right-hand side. Come on in with me, honey. Okay. Here, now let me help you out. Oh, thank you. Hello, Nora. Frankie. Uh, what are you doing here? Joe sent me. I'll wait for you. Where is Joe? You'll find out. Let's go in and get that dope first. Eh? Uh, don't rumble. This gun in my pocket might go off. <laughs> I just got back here myself. Who is this Harry Wheeler who lives here, Jim? I don't know, but he's the one who took those books out of the library. Oh, I see. I came over here right from the library, but Wheeler was gone. Landlady said she didn't know when he was coming back. Oh, that's why you wanted this search warrant. That's right. Let's go in and take a look around his room. Okay. Go ahead, Don. Wheeler's room is on the ground floor. It's first door down there on your right. This one, Jim? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's it, number three. Can you get the key? Yeah, right. to search in here. It doesn't look that way. Jim, how does this Harry Wheeler fit in anyway? I don't know, Don. This is the only lead we've got right now. I see. Hey, Jim. Uh, I think I found something. What is it? Uh, it's a lease on a poultry farm. Well, looks like we came to the right place. Well, it still doesn't hook Wheeler into the bank job, though. All it proves is that there's some connection between Wheeler and Stewart. Don, come here. Huh? What is it, Jim? in this closet. I think this is all the proof we need. Who's that? It's me, Joe. I got company with me. Did you nail him? Yeah, I got him all right. Here's the toll. Joe, Joe, honey. Shut up. Frankie, what'd you bring him back here for? What else could I do? Knock him off in the bank? He brought us here against our will. 
Or me wanted to go away. That's not so. Huh? I didn't want to go away with you at all. Laura. You got me into this, Joe. You made me force my attentions on him. I did it all for you. Joe, she's breaking my heart. You stay out of this. Joe, honey, I was really doing like you asked me to do. Frankie, let's but, get out of here. Joe. Come on, Frankie. Right. There we are, Tony. Hey, what? Who is that? Right. Done. See if any of them are loaded. Right. Oh, Cops, right. huh? You... Special agents of the FBI. Frankie, you let him tell you here. We didn't have to. We found the lease to this place in Wheeler's room. We also found the suit that he wore when you three did the bank job. That suit with the loud strike? That's right. The next suit for all of you will have stripes, too. Now, come on, let's get back to town. Joe Stewart was sentenced to 25 years. His confederate, Frankie, 20 years. Harry and the girl, 15 years each. On charges of bank robbery. And thus, because of careful investigation and the determination to follow every clue to its logical conclusion, your FBI was able to check the careers of four criminals and also was able to return the stolen money. Stolen money that formed part of an aggregate total of more than $36 million, which was returned to you, the citizens of America, after it had been stolen. That, too, is part of the protection which you receive from your local law enforcement agencies and from your FBI. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the official files of your FBI. Now, for a moment, let's get back to the Equitable Society's fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. I've been looking over that chart, Mr. Keating. The way I figure it, it's going to take a load off my mind. From now on, I'm going to stop taking chances with my family's future. And as a first step, I'm going to get one of these charts for myself. Well, Tom, the man who'll see that you get one of these fact-finding charts is your Equitable Society representative. No charge or obligation, of course. Make a note to phone your Equitable Society representative soon. Or send a postcard, care of this ABC station, to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The dramatic story of a cunning killer's attempt to outwit the law. Its subject, extortion. It's titled, The Unwilling Hostess. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. And inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The unwilling hostess on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This Is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Today, all over the country, telephones have been ringing. 
Equitable Society representatives calling up fathers and mothers, telling about the coming announcement from the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Yes? Phil, this is Joe. You know, your Equitable Society representative. Yes, Joe. How goes it? Oh, fine. I just wanted to suggest that you make a point of listening to the middle commercial of This Is Your FBI tonight. The Equitable Society has just published a new and enlarged edition of their famous fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Listen to that middle commercial, and you'll find out how to get the new fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers published by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Tonight's FBI file, The Unwilling Hostess. Webster's Dictionary defines a criminal as one who is guilty of an offense against morality or the public welfare. And that definition is correct as far as it goes. But there are other things which must be added if the criminal is to be defined fully and truly. One of these is that the criminal is basically a moral isolationist, living alone in his own small world and having no conception of his need for other human beings nor any sense of responsibility toward his fellow men. His utter lack of feelings, his constant disregard of the essential dignity of every individual, is what makes him a criminal. And it is important that everyone understand that point. It is impossible to know the real meaning of the word criminal without realizing that to him, other people do not exist so that they may enjoy themselves in a fruitful pursuit of happiness. To him, other people exist merely to serve when he chooses as his next victim. Tonight's file opens in the living room of a home located in a well-to-do suburban section of a large eastern city. One of the occupants of this dwelling, a Mrs. Anderson, is just answering the front doorbell. Just a minute. Mrs. Anderson? That's right. I called you on the phone before. Oh, oh, yes. Please come in. Thank you. Uh, I hope you can put up with an untidy living room. This is our maid's day off. I've just about finished making the bed. <laughs> I understand. Uh, will you sit right over there? Thank you. Uh, would you like some coffee? I just had breakfast, thanks. Oh. <laughs> I I'm terribly sorry, but I've forgotten your name. Clinton. Ruth Clinton. Oh, oh, yes, Mrs. Clinton. Now I remember. You mentioned something on the phone about a new community center. Wasn't that it? That's what I told you when I called. But you can forget that. What? Well, I don't understand. I used that as an excuse for you to invite me here. But why? I was sent here to talk to you. Who sent you? My husband. Walter Clinton. Remember him? Think hard. I don't know anybody with that name. Look, honey, quit stalling. Mrs. Clinton, I'm afraid you'll have to leave. Walter thought you might say that, so uh, he asked me to show you these newspaper clippings. Uh uh, wait. I'll hold them. You just look. See this one, um, your picture? Where did you get those? I told you. Walter gave them to me. Gee, honey. You know, you haven't changed much. What do you want? Walter's in trouble. He needs some help. Walter's been in trouble all of his life. And he wants to see you right away. That's impossible. Look, you wouldn't want him to show these clippings to your husband, would you? He wouldn't say Honey, I'm... you know Walter better than that. All right. I'll see him. Well, I'll call him and have him come right over. <laughs> Meanwhile, in the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is reading a wanted notice when Special Agent Dick Madison approaches his desk. Hello, Jim. Hmm? Oh, hi, Dick. Boss said to check with you. Oh? Oh, I guess he was talking about this thing here, Dick. I don't know that there's very much we can do right now, though. Well, what's the offense? Well, apparently there are two charges. One of them is extortion, the other one is murder. That sounds big. What's the story? An elderly man named George Russell was found dead in a cove in his home. Well, where was this, Jim? How about a town called Hamilton? That's about uh, 100 miles north of here. I see. Russell was quite wealthy. 
When his body was found and showed signs of a bad beating, the police thought that robbery was the motive. What made them change their minds? Well, the old man had a safe in his bedroom that didn't show any signs of having been tampered with. I see. Well, how do we get in the case, Jim? Well, the police called us when they found some extortion notes. One of them contained a threat to kill the old man if he didn't pay. Oh. There were three notes in all, and all of them were signed with the name Charlie. Now, how old were they? All of them were fairly recent. Was there any indication that Russell had paid anything? Well, the local police have been going over his bank account. They found that he'd been making systematic withdrawals of cash for the past few months. I see. The last one of the notes they found was on the stationery of a hotel in Hamilton. The police checked, but no one by the name of Charlie was registered there. This thing is full of dead ends. Well, they did get something from the hotel, though. What was that? Well, they sent the hotel register to our handwriting experts to see if they could find the signature that was in the same handwriting as the extortion notes. How did they make out? They found a Mr. Thomas Norton who was writing matches the notes. Norton had been living there with his wife. Had been living there? Yes. When the police checked, they found that Norton had left, despite the fact that his rent was paid up for two weeks in advance. That sounds fairly suspicious. Any leads on him? Uh, nothing yet. We've sent the extortion notes on to Washington to have them checked against the writings of known extortionists. But so far, we haven't gotten any report. With the notes signed Charlie and the hotel register signed Thomas Norton, we may have somebody with a lot of aliases on our hands. Mm-hmm. Now, what do we do now? Well, the only thing we can do now is wait for Washington to give us some kind of a lead on that handwriting. Answer the door, honey. I think it's Walter. Very well. If there's anybody else, don't let them in. Hello, Livy. It's good to see you again. Well, ain't you asking me in? Come in, Walter. Thanks, honey. Now, let me have a look at you. Oh, sugar, you ain't changed a bit. You're lovely. Just lovely. Save the time, Walter. But, Ruthie, I'm just greeting an old friend. Whatever you call it, you're wasting your time. Look, would you mind telling me now what you both want? Why you came here? Well, it's sort of a social visit in a way. It's been so many years since I've seen you, honey. I just got a big yen to sit down and talk over old times. I'm afraid that wouldn't interest me. Sugar. After all the fun we used to have together. Please tell me what you want. Why, Libby, you're just being downright rude. Walter, get to the point. Okay. Libby, baby, me and Ruth have been doing an awful lot of traveling lately. Quick traveling all around the country. So? So we figured it's time we settle down for a while. And after talking it over, we decided to settle down with you. I know it sounds forward, sugar, but we're moving in. But you, you can't. Why not? Well, my husband... Your is... husband and your kid went away on a hunting trip. That's why we came here. How did you know that? Oh, we know all about you. You see, I made it my business to keep track of you, sugar, no matter where I was. I knew when your husband bought this lovely house. I knew when your son was born. Everything. Why did you bother to keep up with me? Oh, it's a habit of mine. Some folks collect stamps, but I collect people. Oh, the difference is, I use the people I collect. Well, you can't use me. I refuse to let you stay here. I want you both to leave at once. And what about these clippings, honey? You want your husband to see them? Well, that's a sugar. Do you? No. Then I guess we stay. Ruthie, have you ever tasted real fried chicken? No. Well, then I'll bet you if we coax a little, Libby will go out in the kitchen and cook us up a nice old-fashioned southern dinner. Want a little more coffee, Ruthie? No, thanks. <laughs> Was I lying about that chicken? No. It was okay. You hear that, Libby? Yes. Well, look, please, sugar, when somebody praises you like that. Leave me alone. Oh, lay off her. I ain't picking on her. She's just touchy. <clears throat> you know, she never used to be like that. Once upon a time, she used to just love every word I said. She's really crazy about me. That's not true. I was a silly high school kid who thought it was romantic to go around with you. But, Sugar, you used to spend all your time with me. Why'd you do that? I, I didn't know any better. <laughs> Ruthie, you know, Libby wouldn't let me go out alone, even when I was going to stick up a gas station. I didn't know you were going to hold up that man that night. <laughs> Sugar, you told that same story to the judge, and even that nice old man didn't believe you. Well, it was true. <laughs> yeah, but we got newspaper clippings that say different. <laughs> That's what got us in here, remember? Yes. 
How come you never told your husband about this? Ruthie, I explained that to you before we came. Libby always was quite a lady. And she always was proud. In fact, the thing she's proudest of is that she's a lady. Now, nobody like that would want her husband to know that she was once a jailbird. Right, sugar? I'm going upstairs. Wait a minute. What is it? Where do me and Ruth sleep? Upstairs. First bedroom on the left. Okay. Good night, Libby. Sweet dreams, honey. Dick, I think we've got something to work on now. What came in? A couple of things. The first one was a report from the handwriting department at Washington. Did they identify the notes? Yes, it was an extortionist named Walter Clinton. At least that was the name he used the last time he was arrested. Then we were right about the string of aliases. <laughs> yes, we were. I've got his record here. It shows that he's been arrested under 13 different names. How does he happen to be running around loose if he's been arrested that many times? It's the same old story, an easy state parole board. He sounds like a fine one to get a parole. Well, he got one. I don't know how. And it cost George Russell his life. Mm. Oh, Jim, hmm? you said before that two things had come up. What's the other one? Oh, there was a car stolen in Hamilton the day that Clinton and his wife left the hotel up there. The car was parked around the corner from the hotel the last time the owner saw it. And that's the car that Clinton traveled in? That's it. Across the state line. It was found abandoned in, uh, this morning here in town. That means he's probably still around someplace. Local police are checking every hotel and rooming house in the city. If he's in any of them, we'll find him. Has any check been made at the transportation terminals? Yes, they've all been supplied with pictures of Clinton. Good. So if Clinton and his wife try to move out of town now, the odds are pretty much against him. Have we got any description on Mrs. Clinton? Only a very general one. He's the one we'll have to call her. Well, what do you think we ought to do, Jim? Well, I don't think there's very much we can do right now, Dick. I think maybe we ought to go home, get some sleep, so we can start fresh in the morning. I'll meet you here at 8 o'clock. <laughs> What is it? Just seen if you were sleeping yet. I'm not. Real nice here, ain't it? Look, don't worry about Libby. She'll warm up to us after a while. You just remember why we came here, will you? What do you mean? Keep your mind on your business. Honey, are you angry with Walter? Just quit trying to make character with her. Oh, sugar. Don't, oh, sugar me. I'm just trying to make the whole thing easier for you. Excuse me, please. Yes, Sugar, what is it? My husband just telephoned. You'll have to get off. Why? They're coming home. When? They, they started to drive back tonight. Where'd they call from? Uh, Hartsville. Where? It's about 300 miles from here up in the mountains. Oh, well, then there's no hurry. They won't be back too quick. They'll be here tomorrow night. You'll have to go first thing in the morning. Very well. But I thought you said we were going to stay here for a while. Not when we're not bothered. You really do. Yeah. But there'll be a slight charge. What are you talking about? Well... I think maybe you'd like to have those Clintons, wouldn't you? Oh, yes. Okay. You can have them, honey. For $10,000. Ten thousand dollars. Ten thousand? Walter, I haven't got that kind of money. Well, then go sell your jewelry. Go get it from the bank. Go any place. Just get the money. Now, honey, you go get yourself a good night's sleep. Tomorrow's going to be a big day for all of us. Return in just a moment to tonight's file, which shows how your FBI promotes security for the nation. Now let's bring this question of security closer to home. Phil, have you got a minute to take a look at this new Equitable Society chart? Why, sure. Oh, it's that fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers you were talking about last week. Right. The new and revised edition of the Equitable Society's famous fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. I understand it's designed to show me just how much income my wife and kids would need to live on... If I should die. That's it, Phil. You'll know within a dollar or two how much money would be required to keep them well-fed, well-housed, and well-clothed. And what's more, with the help of this Equitable Society chart, you'll have the answer in five minutes flat. Look, you're guided every step of the way by easy-to-understand pictures which illustrate the rock-bottom expenses your family will have to meet. And when you've finished, you'll have a clear, accurate, and complete picture of just what income your family would need during the critical years. Critical years? I'm not sure I know just what you mean by that. The years before your youngest child finishes high school. 
years during which the home must have a minimum income to keep it together. You don't have to tell me any more, Mr. Keating. Just tell me where I can buy one of those fact-finding charts. Well, they're not for sale, Phil. They're free. The Equitable Society representative in your community will be glad to bring you a copy. Sit down with him, you and your wife together. There's no obligation, and get a true picture of where you stand. Phone him tomorrow to bring you an equitable fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Or send a postcard, care of this ABC station, to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Unwilling Hostess. Nearly 5,000 major crimes committed every day in the United States. Many of them fall into the category of crimes against property. Those crimes include arson and burglary and auto theft. The other classification is known as crimes against the person. These include murder, armed robbery, kidnapping, and extortion. Of all the crimes committed... Perhaps the most vicious, the most basically cruel, is extortion. Because it affects not only the personal safety of the victim, but also his mind. It traps the victim in a terrible vice from which escape is possible two ways, neither of which are attractive. The first and most obvious is to pay the extortioner, and possibly thus to invite a lifetime of further extortion. The other way to escape And the only logical way is to do what the victim in tonight's case from the files of your FBI should have done. That infallible means of escape is to call your local police. Like your FBI, they have a remedy for extortion. But that remedy cannot be applied without the cooperation of you, the victim. Tonight's file continues in the local FBI field office. Morning, Jim. Morning, Dick. I've been waiting for you. What's up? I got a call at home early this morning from Lieutenant Bell of the local police. What did he want? A watch belonging to George Russell turned up in a pawn shop. Here? Yeah. When? This morning. Did you talk to the pawnbroker? Yes, yes. yes. Who turned in the watch? Pawnbroker remembered the man, and from the description, it was Walter Clinton. But that report that came in on the missing watch said it had Russell's name on the case. Mm. How could Clinton pawn it? Well, according to the pawnbroker, Clinton identified himself as Russell and showed him an old credit card of Russell. He must have taken that when he killed the old man. I guess so. I checked on the pawn shop. It's legitimate. This is the first time any stolen goods have ever turned up there. I see. When was it pawned? Yesterday morning. Sounds like Clinton is still in town. He is. Lieutenant Bell just called again a few minutes ago. The police have located Clinton's hideout. Where is it? He and his wife have a furnished room over at 411 North Chester Street. Let's pick up a search warrant, Dick, and get over there. Morning, Libby. Oh, how I did sleep. Hmm, like an innocent babe. Well, Sugar, have you figured out how to get hold of that $10,000? Yes. How are you going to do it? I'm selling my jewelry. Why, you sweet child! I I still matter to you, don't I? The only thing that matters is getting you out of here. Now, you can't fool me, Sugar. Go away, please. You look so pretty this morning, Libby. Fresh as a do-dip rose. Leave me alone. Now, Sugar... Break it up. Uh, Keep your hands off that dame. What are you so angry about? What do you think? I think you're jealous. You just tend to business. But I was. Libby's going to go downtown and sell her jewelry. Is that right? Yes. When are you going? Right now. Ruthie, you're going into town, too. What for? To get us some railroad tickets to New York. And, honey, you better get us on different trains, too. Just in case anybody's looking for the two of us together. Okay. Now, scat. Go on, scat, scat, both of you. And as soon as you're finished, you come right home. I'll have a candle in the window. Here's the room, Dick, number 11. I'll unlock it. Okay. 
Go ahead, Dick. Thanks, Jim. Not very big, is it? No. Shouldn't take us too long to go over it. I wonder where they stayed last night. Well, if Clinton's following his usual pattern, he's got an extortion victim here, too. It's amazing the number of people he's been able to get money from. And don't forget we don't know about all of them. Don't forget that half of the extortion victims don't report it. Doesn't make much sense, does it? No. Then the kind of false pride that keeps them from reporting it doesn't make much sense either. No, I guess not. Well, nothing in this bureau. Jim, I have hey, a hunch. Look here. This might be something. That phone book? Yes, it was laying open in this place. Take a look at those page numbers. 32 and 35. There's a page missing. Mm-hmm. Just might be that the new victim's name is on that page, Dick. We could check and see. It means going through about 800 names, Jim. I know. Let's get back to the office and start calling. It makes 15 for me. How many get done, Dick? Twelve. Well, that leaves approximately 775 to go. Clinton can get the Californian back by the time we finish the... Uh, worst part of it is that even if we're right about this page having the victim's name on it, he might not admit it if we call him. I've been thinking about that myself. I guess. Special Agent Taylor. Hello. Hello. I called the police and they told me to call you. Yes? I understand you're looking for a man named Walter Clinton. Dick, check this call. Yes, ma'am, we are. He's going to be on the 614 train out of here tonight for New York. 614 and... Uh, how do you know that, ma'am? Never mind how I know. I'm telling you he'll be on that train. Do you want his space number? Uh, yes, please. He'll have compartment B on train number 21. Compartment B, train number 21. I see, and uh, may I ask uh, who this is? I'm just a citizen who wants to see justice done. Mm-hmm. Well, that's very commendable of you, ma'am. You'll Will be you sure please? to have someone at the station to arrest him. Oh, Aren't yes, you? Uh, we will. Fine, goodbye. Bye-bye. Hello. Dick, I hope they were able to trace that. I talked as long as I could before she hung up. Our operator's calling me right back. Good. She said Clinton was going to be on the 614 in New York. Is that the space on the train she gave you? That's right. Special Agent Madison. Well, I see. Thank you very much. Well? I'm afraid it's not going to be too much help, Jim. That call was made from a pay station. Where's the phone located? In a drugstore at Main and 48th. Might be more help than you think, Dick. Let's see that page out of the phone book. Is that you, Libby? Yes. I'm in the living room, sugar. Did you get the money? Yes, I have it right here. Ten thousand? Mm-hmm. Oh, you're an angel. Let's have it, sugar. Here you are. You know, I was beginning to worry about you. Little old Ruthie's been home for almost an hour. Where is she? She's upstairs. She had a headache. Wanted some aspirin. Call her down. I want you both to leave at once. You don't have to call. I'm here. Look here, Ruthie. We got the money. Well, I'd like those clippings. Why, sure, honey. You're entitled to them. You get what you pay for. I'll let you have them just as soon as I finish counting this green stuff. Walter, um... Maybe you'd better let me carry that. The money? Yes. What for? Well, in case you get picked up. Uh Uh-uh. Why not? I peeked in your bag while you were out. You what? Mm Mm-hmm. I saw that you bought a ticket for me to New York and one for you for California. Hmm. Looks like you were going to take the money and hang me up. Right, Ruth? Of course I... You're lying, Ruthie. Uh, Ain't you, sugar? Uh, Ain't you? Have you enough of that, Clinton? What? Who are you? I'm from the FBI. The maid let me in the back way. There's another agent out in front. What are you doing here? You're supposed to be at the train. No, you call the FBI. Yeah, you should have called us, Clinton. We traced the call to a drugstore on the corner. But how did you know he was in this house? He tore a page out of the phone book that has your name on it. There are only three names on either side of that page within two miles of that drugstore, so we checked those three first. All right, come on, Clinton. And uh, you too, Mrs. Clinton. Let's not keep my partner waiting too long. Walter 
Walter Clinton was sentenced to 10 years for violation of the extortion statutes, after which he was turned over to local authorities to face charges of murder. His wife, Ruth, was sentenced to a six-year term in a federal penitentiary. With those convictions, your FBI was able to close another case involving murder and extortion, two of the most serious crimes in the federal code of law. But these crimes and others like them will continue to be committed so long as the general public retains its present apathy regarding the very serious and dangerous rising tide of lawlessness. You, the decent citizen listening to this program tonight, can do something about this if you want to take the trouble. The biggest step you could take in the right direction would be to join with your fellow citizens in seeing to it that you have a strong and alert and above all a politically unhampered local police force. Your FBI will always be available as a final bastion against crime. But your first line of defense against the criminal army in America today is in your hometown. And the stronger you make your local police, the better your protection will be. That is the job you can do if you want to help in fighting America's rising tide of lawlessness. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the official files of your FBI. Now, one last word to all the fathers and mothers in our audience who want to get copies of the new and enlarged edition of the fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers just published by the Equitable Life Assurance Society. I believe you said that this chart is not for sale. That's right, Phil. You can't buy it. It's free. And the man who'll be glad to see that you get one of these fact-finding charts is your Equitable Society representative. No charge or obligation, of course. Make a note to phone your Equitable Society representative soon. Or send a postcard, care of this ABC station, to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A case describing one of the vilest of rackets. Its subject, Black Market Babies. Its title, The Mercenary Mother. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Mercenary Mother on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.